Um, so I am uh, I am a musician, um, and I have a diagnosis of bipolar. I was diagnosed in two thousand and eight. Um, after years and years of going to doctors, going something really wrong. I don't know what's wrong with me, but uh, anyway, finally the, the doctor said uh, you have a rapid cycling bipolar, um, which means that, um, as my mother would say, I'm up and down like a whore's drawers. Um, so. Um, so tonight, it's good because uh, Sally asked me to step up, so I have the privilege of being the headline act and the warm-up act, um, <laughs> which is ironic, isn't it? Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about bipolar and, and how it affects me, and then we're going uh, then we're going to do some musical activities. Um, so if I could just find out if you don't like audience participation, can you put your hands up? <laughs> <laughs> You're very good, aren't you? Anyway, so let me talk about bipolar first, because you may, as soon as you heard that word, you may have had a, an idea, uh, you may know something about it, you might have thought about um, EastEnders, or uh, somebody you know, or goes bipolar, you might not really know what bipolar is, and uh, you might want to find out more. So I'll tell you what it is for me. Um, so I looked it up in the dictionary, and as an adjective, uh, it means having or relating to two poles or extremities or characterised by both manic and depressive moods. Um, and so that's bipolar. And disorder is a really interesting word um, because as a noun, it means a state of confusion, untidiness, chaos, confusion. Um, but as a verb, it means to disrupt the systematic function of something or to be... Uh, windswept or wild. Um, so I prefer the verb because it makes me sound like Heathcliff <laughs> looking for Kathy. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try and put a positive spin on uh, bipolar um, and mental health. Um, so as, as you probably aware, there's, there's been years and years of uh, discussion as to why a mental health condition is... Oh, for that. <laughs> I feel, I feel like Terry Wogan. Um, so, so people debate, you know, why, uh, why is it harder to understand a mental health condition that is a physical condition, which is also ironic because a mental health condition is just something physical in your brain. It's a chemical imbalance or anything like that. Your brain is a physical entity and therefore the way your brain functions is physical. Um, but often people use this analogy that, oh, well, you know, it's, it's easier to understand a broken leg. You know, if you have a broken leg, people can see it and understand it. Um, but if you have a mental health condition, it's all in your head, which actually it is. Um, it's just not attached to your pelvis. But it's entirely the same thing. Um, <laughs> maybe your head is attached to your pelvis, I don't know. Um, so both these things need treatment. They both need understanding. They both need time to heal. And they both need an adaptation. You know, you, you wouldn't expect somebody with a broken leg to run a marathon. So why do we uh, naturally expect people with a mental health condition to be able to perform certain tasks when they're at that particular time they're not capable of doing it? Um, so this broken leg analogy got me thinking about how we, um, how we look at a lot of things visually. Um, rather than kind of looking beyond that. George Martin, the producer of The Beatles, said the problem is these days people listen to music with their eyes. Um, and I think it's, a, you know, it's possibly a fair comment. Um, so I guess if, if people approach things uh, just with their, with their eyesight about what they see and what they know, if they don't know very much, um, maybe through miseducation, they maybe only see things on a very narrow spectrum. But if they know more then they can see things with a full sort of six senses. Um, so I have no idea what you're thinking about me. I have no idea what you're thinking as you're looking at me. Um, but I do have bipolar, and I will hopefully try and demonstrate through the power of music um, kind of what bipolar to me sounds like as well. Because maybe if I can explain it to you in sound, you may have a, you may have a reaction to that. Um, so... Going back to this diagnosis of bipolar, um, I suppose it's a human condition to kind of ask, well, why, why me? You know, why me? You know, um, we get ill and we ask, well, 
Why me and why not you? So I'll tell you a little bit about myself um, and how I've reflected back. Um, so I was born in a town in Kent called Gravesend, um, which by, as the name suggests, is a pretty... <laughs> <laughs> it's like the end of the grave. It's like the m it's a pretty miserable place. No, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Um, anyway, I grew up in a pretty average household, um, mm. semi-detached house with my mum, my dad, and my two older brothers, uh, Trevor at the oldest and Darren in the middle. Uh, five, kind of five years between right. us all. And um, my eldest brother, Trevor, as we now understand, had potentially schizophrenia or borderline personality disorder. And this kind of gave a lot of challenges growing up um, in that environment. So my, one of my earliest memories is maybe when I was about six or seven, so I'm laying in bed and my bed faces the doorway into the hallway where all the other rooms are. And as per most evenings, an, ar an argument erupted between my parents and my brother. So one of my earliest memories is the door being kicked in and seeing my brother hitting my mother uh, until my father was able to intervene and basically take him down and put him on the floor. It's one of my earliest memories, and it's as vivid as that. I have other memories. Um, on Saturday morning, my mum and dad would go to the supermarket and they would leave Trevor in charge of me and my brother. And one day, an argument ensued between my two brothers, which resulted in Trevor holding my brother against the wall with a kitchen knife to his throat. And bear in mind, my brother was a teenager at this point, so I was eight or nine. And the, the odd thing about this is when my parents came home from Tesco, they said, no, is everything all right while we were away? And I said, yeah, it's all fine. Trevor tried to knife Darren. <laughs> But nothing else happened. And it was that nonchalant. It was that uh, regular that these things would happen. So as a child, I thought these were normal. I thought it was normal to sit at the top of the stairs and watch my mother barricade the front door, screaming as my elder brother on the other side took a garden fork to the door and tried to prise the door frame open. I thought it was normal that my brother was discovered in the outside toilet having taken an overdose. I thought it was normal to go to friends' houses for sleepovers because my mother and father would have to go all over the country to pick my brother up because he'd run away. Um, so this was kind of, this is how I grew up, you know, um, which I now know is really abusive uh, childhood. But for me at the time, it was just childhood. I thought it was just normal. It was kind of what happened to me. Um, so, That kind of went through my life. I mean, Trevor, by 18, Trevor was involved in crime. Uh, he was in bail hostels. My mother and my father refused to have him home again. Um, he later disappeared for about 20 years, and nobody knew where, where he was. We couldn't grieve as a family because we didn't know if he was alive or dead. Um, and then eventually he kind of popped up. His an email address popped up, weirdly, in a on a gum tree ad, and, I, and the name was there, and I thought, well, maybe. This was about 10 years ago. I got in touch, and sure enough, it turned out to be my brother. We met, uh, we used to meet for drinks in London. He was a hell of a drinker. Um, so we used to meet in London. He would never tell me what had happened in the last 20 years. Uh, but he was really supportive. Um, unfortunately, I was the last member of my family to see him alive. I was the last member of my family to speak to him. And I'm the only member of my family to have stood in the prison cell in Pentonville when he took his life. Um, he was 42 when he took his life. And the weird thing is, I'm now 43. So I'm older than my oldest brother. So that's kind of odd. I didn't expect that to happen. Um, so it's kind of this thing that's, that's, that's been through my life. And um, when we talk about emotional trauma now, there's a huge amount of understanding. Certainly, Brian, there's a huge amount of understanding how child development works. But back in the 80s, it was just, my parents were told, well, you're just a bad parent. Go home and smack him until he burns himself. Which ironically was the worst thing to do, really. Because um, you're quite good at smacking back. Um, so, living, growing up in emotional trauma, there, there's, there's now known to be a lot of these things that affect us. Um, 
an increased uh, tendency towards alcoholism and substance misuse. Um, as of this moment, I'm now 14 months sober, which is the longest I've ever been in my life. Um, I am also a musician, so it was an occupational hazard to get as pissed as possible before going on stage. Um, so uh, other things that uh, are known to affect childhood development with emotional trauma are behavioural regulation, difficulty regulating arousal levels, emotional and sensory overload, difficulty with attention and memory, uh, reactivity to sensory stimuli, disruptions to sleep, and a compromised language usage. Um, so I'll let you be the judge of that, whether I've got that or not. Um, so basically without Without medication, this is, uh, this is what bipolar is like for me. Um, I, without medication, I am uh, like a Ferrari. Right? It's like owning a Ferrari. And you, you know, I'm sure some of you know what that's like. <laughs> uh, it's like owning a Ferrari. You know, I wake up and I'm red and I'm shiny and I'm cool as. And I'm out in the town and I'm showing off my Ferrari and everyone's looking at me going, fucking hell yeah. But the difficulty is, sometimes I wake up and I'm a larder. Right? Um, and if you're too young to remember, larder isn't where you keep your lentils from Infinity Food. It's a really shit Eastern Bloc car that looks like a child designed it. Right? So, so some days, you know, I, I'm a Ferrari and I'm, yeah, and then I go to bed and I wake up and I'm a larder. I know what to do with that. Um, so, so with sobriety and medication, basically, I'm a full focus. Right, so I'm pretty reliable, I'm, more, I'm not too embarrassing to be seen, I'm quite a comfy ride. Um, I was once, well I was once, no in fact I, move on. Um, so I'm, I'm alright, and, um, and what I've come to realise is um, that's the kind of tempering that I need, um, but with um, the same with music, uh, the way people view a mental health condition is a little bit like how an audience views music. You see, so if, you, if you've already got an understanding of music, if uh, this is why Dancing Queen is such a floor filler, you know. You know, dancing, you know kick that off on a wedding, everybody's on the dance floor. Because you know what it is, it's Abra, it's Dancing Queen, everybody dances to it. Put on some Stockhausen, probably <laughs> going to kill the room, okay? Oh look, bugger off Brighton and Hove. Don't want to go on your... Um, so, because we bring a kind of an expectation of what we think music is to the, to the room, yeah, when, when we listen to it, we go, ah, oh, that's music, I understand that. And equally with, I kind of question with mental health, um, you know, if there's a, mental health and physical health, if there's, a, if there's an actual visual cue, oh, somebody's got a broken leg, oh, I understand that's a broken leg, oh, how are you, I've got a broken leg, oh, sorry about that. But with a mental health condition, you can't see it. So there's this real correlation between um, how an audience, how you as an audience or we as an audience kind of judge and see things. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is what I was kind of saying. You get quite, side, get quite sidetracked. It's the memory thing. Did I just say that? Um, so I'm kind of wondering if, uh, in the way that some pieces of music are kind of a little bit more challenging to listen to, um, but if we listen to them, we really get something a bit more out of it. And if we listen to prog rock, it's much harder to listen to than the Spice Girls. <laughs> well. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Something you've got to listen to. So in the same way, you know, mental health condition, it, maybe if we actually listen a little bit more rather than look at what we see, maybe we hear a little bit more. Um, so anyway, this is where we're going to do... Um, so this is where we're going to do an exercise, okay? You ready? You right for this? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, it is a non-visual exercise. Okay. Uh, so you are going to have to close your eyes. You ready to do that? Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk in a very deep way. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm going to. Where's the stand? Where's the mic stand? Can I borrow them from next stand? So you've all got your eyes shut. Yeah. Okay. So what I want you to do is I want you to listen to the sound of the room. Okay, so I want you to listen. Maybe you can hear a car outside or you can hear the person next to you breathing or maybe you're on a date. You can hear the other person breathing next to you. 
Okay, so you've got to listen. Maybe you hear the hum of the lights. So what I'd like you to do with your eyes shut is I would like you to just start humming. A very low hum. Can you do that? Okay, so keep doing that. When your breath runs out, take another breath and then just keep doing it. So, make that hum a little bit louder. Okay, so all of those who identify as men, try and make your voices much louder. And all of those who live in a flat, Try and make your voices higher. And the humming keep going. You probably all live in flats in Brighton because no one can afford a house anymore. Okay, well I'd like you to, anybody who's wearing green, I'd like you to make the sound of a ticking clock. I'd like that clock to get faster. the clock to get faster, I like the noise to get louder, I like the higher pitch to get higher. Okay, so everybody with red hair, I'd like you to stop and just listen to the sound around you. Anybody with glasses, I'd like you to stop and just listen to the sound around you. Anybody that didn't pay for a ticket tonight, I'd like you to stop and just listen to the sound around you. And anybody who's a ticking clock, I'd like you to slow down. Thank you for playing along. Um, so that is about the closest I can get to uh, what bipolar sounds like to me. Um, and that goes on on a daily basis. So I have to constantly, minute by minute, <coughs> regulate all of these changes. I have to ask these things to calm down. I have to ask these things to speed up if I need to be in that certain frame of mind. What I found quite interesting, and maybe what you didn't realize, is as soon as a sound that you recognized as music came into the room, almost everybody stopped and listened. Is that right? So this is inherently my point, is that if you hear something you recognize, you listen to it. With mental health, a mental health condition, you can't necessarily see that condition. So you have to listen. You have to listen to the person. And when you listen, you hear them. And then when you hear them, you start to hear things you recognize. And everything starts to make sense. And you see a lot of yourself in that person. And then you have a connection. The music is all about making a connection. And it's about working out the way that you relate to somebody, the way a performer relates to an audience. So my final kind of closure of all of this, I'll take this off here. So I look more like a stand-up comedian now. 
My final point of all of this is when I was preparing this talk, um, and actually part of what I'm doing this year is, is really speaking publicly about my condition, because I've hidden it. I've hidden it um, under substances, I've hidden it under careers. I've actually ironically worked in an industry that says it is really open to mental health. Um, but I've still hidden it. Uh, and I don't know why I've hidden it um, all this time, really. So I've kind of lied to myself and I've lied to other people. Um, so it's really important for me to talk about this. And the more I talk about it, the more I see people nodding and going, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I get that. So maybe a few people feel a little bit more confident um, about themselves and they might feel confident to go home and talk to somebody. Uh, you don't, uh, dear God, I pray you don't go through some of what I went through. It wasn't the worst that people have been through. It's definitely not the worst, but it wasn't the nicest. I hope you don't have to go through that to get to a point where you kind of start to figure yourself out. Um, but maybe when you come away from this, maybe you just keep that analogy of music in mind. If you sit down, you know, years ago we used to sit and put, put an actual whole e LP on. Are we all that old? We used to put an LP on, you know, uh, and sit and listen to it and look at the cover and do all that. And it was a, actually a kind of thing you took time doing. And now everything is just tick, 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 now boring, boring, that song's boring. You know, it's like. Um, it's like Queen, uh, Queen now release of uh, vodka, right, with uh, Freddie Mercury on the label. You know, it's like Queen vodka, because Freddie was fond of a tipple. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is ridiculous, because he also loved cocaine. Um, <laughs> but I don't see them releasing branded cocaine called Another One Bites the Dust or something, I don't know. <laughs> um, and... Um, <laughs> Paul Weller, Paul Weller just sold the rights to that entertainment to McDonald's, no. you know. So he's loving it, you know, he, he really is just like <laughs> coining it in. I mean, you know, and, and so, so, so music in a lot of ways, socially, has become this disposable thing, but actually it deserves to be listened to. And people with mental health, I fear they're becoming this disposable thing. But people need to be listened to, and you need to hear their stories. Um, so that's my story. And that's where I am, and I'm really privileged to be asked to, to come up and do that. And uh, yeah, um, may your God go with you. <laughs>